fairly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how many of you are developers actually here? Wow, almost all seniors. The ones who are not developers, please become ones. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, first I would like to apologize for my Balkan English. It's kind of broken, but we can talk later if you want. So that being said, what is wrong with the JavaScript? And could somebody please close the door? Thank you. Okay, have you ever noticed this NPM repository that is growing like you've never seen before? It's totally wild there. And it's like every new framework is every few months, I guess. And it's a lot of pressure. If you want to be good at it, if you want to find a good job, it's pressure to know all of these frameworks. Well, they are not actually Pokemon. You don't have to collect them all. But well, web is a very complicated place without it. You have to know at least five languages, three frameworks, just, just to get you started. But the good news that is tooling is getting better and better. And that is good news in, in my book, at least. So more often than not, JavaScript applications, web applications, can explode with complexity that's to the point that developers are kind of afraid to touch it, to change something. They're afraid they will break something, you know, because a couple of people already worked on it and they left the company and it's a tough job. Listen, I could talk about state of web development probably all day, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try some, give you some solid advice how to survive this jungle. OK? Ah, here's the illustration. I'm not actually a designer. I'm a developer. So I'm very proud of it. <laughs> this is representation of one typical web application or web page. I'm not saying that there are not others like this. There's there are some of them are totally different, like using uh, module loaders or some, something like that. They are ar architectured in a totally different way. And there's nothing wrong with that, absolutely. But this is a typical situation that you have a, <clears throat> a bunch of sc scripts at a uh, header. They are most, of, most likely your frameworks or libraries or dozen of them, like 10 or 15 or 20. Who knows? and a couple of your custom in modules. And inside, you, in body, you have a bunch of inline scripts that are doing stuff, uh, communicating with each other, and so on, and so on. And the bottom, you, you would probably have more libraries and more frameworks and more of your inline scripts, and all communicating with each other, manipulating elements, doing what not. And stuff gets really easy out of hand, especially because each of them must communicate to it, each other. And they're all coupled together. And did you ever had a situation at work that you need to change a little something in your code? And you change that little something, and something on totally different end breaks unexpectedly, usually in production. And that's why it's unexpected, right? Or you need to, yeah, well, there probably all of you. Or you need to change little something, just a little something, to just, uh, your manager sees it as little something. And you need to ch move a mountain to do that. You need to probably change a couple of modules to do that. That's a it's pretty rough situation, if you ask me. It looks bad for you. The first situation, when something unexpectedly breaks, that's called fragility, or code is fragile, right? And we don't want to do have nothing with that. We, ho we want to have reliability. Second situation is rigidity. We want to have flexible code, not rigid code. We want to move, move modules around and be efficient at what, the, what we do. Because it looks good for us, right? OK, there are other stuff like maintainability, stability, readability, testability, and so on. But they are pretty general. So here's a description of, abstract description of that situation. Well, everybody who is developer recognizes what is this. This is tight coupling, right? 
so I want to change something in A, and it's high probability that D, D will break, or in order to change A, you have to change B, C, D, or to test A, God forbid, who knows what can happen. Well, that's got pretty complicated. So what can we do about it? First piece of advice is, since we are talking about JavaScript, is actually JavaScript library. Who would have predicted that? <laughs> That's the way it is in JavaScript, I guess. Well, it, this one is really small. It's about compressed. It's about 200 bytes, amazingly small. And it is constructed to decouple those components. And it can be found all over the web, even for the React have some plugin for that, and called Publish Subscribe. Everyone heard of that? No one has heard about, about Publish Subscribe. Pops up, anybody? OK. It's actually all the communication pattern. From, it predates JavaScript by a long time. It's communication pattern. It's designed to publish events. and. Any number of subscribers could subscribe and do what the, what the hell ever they want. The idea is those models do, do not communicate directly to each other, but rather to in some kind of uncoupled manner to one send, sending <coughs> publishing events. And anyone who is interested could subscribe and do whatever it wants. It goes without saying this could be horribly over misused and overused like anything else, All right? <clears throat> well, uh, good, uh, good advice is always publish an event, never an issue in a comment, because when you issue a comment, you have to issue a comment to somebody. You command somebody something to do. That's kind of cap coupling again, right? It's, uh, that has its own name. It's semantic coupling or some shit. Sorry. <laughs> Rather than uh, issuing a comment, Publish an event, like I'm presenting somebody, something. I'm having an awesome presentation. And everyone who is interested can subscribe to it, right? So I don't care who is. I'm just doing my stuff, so everyone who is interested will subscribe. OK, this is how it looks. You can publish any event that you want. You can, it can be general event like model is bounded or grid is rendered, or it, it can be even a business event, like order is placed. Ah, this makes sense. As I said, these new frameworks all have these plugins to do this. It's very small. You can write it by your own if you want, if you want to. OK? Uh, this, I'm not going to try to pronounce. I actually spent all night trying to pronounce this. I give up. Well, every framework or UI framework or whatever that has its own set, com set of standard controls offers a chance for you to build your own control. Why don't you do that? It's very good practice for you. You will learn something. And controls are decoupled by its nature. Every framework that I know, including React, that's like mo most popular ever. Excuse me. <laughs> but don't, don't put custom logic in it, but it, it will get you in trouble big time. OK, let's move forward. Yes, but this is controversial, actually, for some people. I don't know why. It happens to be that you have some pieces of logic that you can put in front end and in back end. And lately, mo most of advices are do it on front end. It's cool. Well, it's not like that front end is not getting complicated very fast. And it, this complicated controls, everything flying around, it's complex already. If you can do it on back end, please do it on back end if you can. Does that make sense? If back end is kind of stable environment. It's predictable environment. Front end is kind of, it must run on many devices, many screen sizes. It's not so much predictable. So and there's uh, the other thing that you can duplicate your logic by doing stuff on front end. And you can maybe have it all needed someday on the back end. Right? 
So that's why we have view models versus API endpoints. OK. I'm losing my voice here. JSON issues. What could go wrong with the JSON? Everybody loves JSON. It's dynamic. It's simple. Well, if you don't have schema and you have 10 models that depend, if you don't have schema enforced, that's what I wanted to say, and you have like 10 models that depend on that schema, and somebody changes your JSON endpoint, it all hell breaks loose. <laughs> can be very rough if you're not careful. I once had the opportunity to work on a project that had a WebSocket service that was actually sending some JSON structures to your application randomly. At every, every push, it was different schema. So it was kind of hell, hellish. Well, design matters. I'm not talking about web design. Well, when I was younger, design, design was method. It was code design, actually. It was your software design, not your layout and colors and stuff like that. It seems to be, well, JavaScript is very easy language to start with. You can be very productive at the beginning, but as stuff scales, it can be very rough if you're not careful, if, you, if your code is not designed very well. OK. OK, so I'm going to go there. Everybody heard about solid principles. Uh, last week was very interesting for me because uh, I, told, I told some colleagues that I'm going to do this talk, and I'm going to talk about solid principles. And just explain to me, I started explaining, and they're saying, oh, it's like in React. So React uses that stuff, obviously, but I didn't know that because I still don't use React, and I probably will start. <clears throat> OK. It's a solid principles are, well, according to Wikipedia, that's to, to make your co code easy to maintain and did the extent over, over time. There are five of them, this, this acronym, and this is the first, first of them. So it says that similar things should be grouped together, and models should have only one reason to change. It says something how, how to construct your models. You will have your models either way. So what to put in those models? This is the good way to start. One, Model should have only one reason to change. That is one axis of change. And that is if you're using some ticket system, that is one ticket, if you think about it. Here's an example. Here, here you have a toolbar. OK, and you have grid. And grid can have changes like, did you have any situation that you need to change some formatting in your uh, I don't know, report or grid, and something else completely breaks. That is because those responsibilities are coupled. They're, it's all, all in one module. And it's chance that you can, it's just, there's a chance that you can ch change something that you don't want. That's all that it boils to. OK. Open closed principle, there's, well, there's, it says that you need to close your code for changes and open for extensions. And there are many, many different ways to do that in JavaScript, but the main, main thing is abstraction. So you want, want to abstract a way to calls to another system so that you can change them easily. OK. Other principles are there, of course, risk of substitution, there's the interface segregation, and dependency version, dependency ejection. Well, it, uh, Liskov of substitution is called by famous scientist Barbara Liskov. It says something about inheritance. That's how it's overused in applications. I see that many times because inheritance couples inherited class and derived class. And it says it should be substitutable. Interface seg segregation says that your model shouldn't rely, depend on mo interfaces that don't, they don't use. If you don't use something, you shouldn't be 
coupled with that. Okay, and dependency version, that's the basis for bu building frameworks and plugin architecture. Thank you, we have five minutes more. And it, the best thing that you can do for your code design is, of course, to use TDD. Uh, everybody guess no, here knows what that is. So this is when you translate your requirements into test cases, write fa failing tests, write some code, just enough to pass the test code green, and refactor and do it all over again. And this is pretty much it.